Okay. Hey guys, good evening and welcome to Community Conversations with Councilwoman Tamika Isaac Devine. Uh, thank y'all so much for joining us. Uh, y'all know I kind of try and come in at least once a week. This week I've come in more than once just because this is Women's Suffrage Week. Um, last week uh, we commemorated the, um, the ratification of the 19th Amendment and today is Women's Equality Day. And so I wanted to bring you guys a very special guest to celebrate Women's Equality Day. So I want to start as I'm saying happy Women's Equality Day to all my sisters out there. Um, and for those of you who don't understand what Women's Equality Day is, Women's Qual Equality Day uh, was proclaimed um, for August 26th um, in an opportunity to recognize uh, the commemoration of the, um, the 1920th in 1920, when the 19th Amendment was ratified um, and when women got their right to vote. And we do know, um, and I've talked about this before, that although uh, women were uh, uh, granted the right to vote with the 19th Amendment, not all women got the right to vote. Um, African-American women who were part of that suffrage movement did not get the right to vote. And so we want to make sure that we educate ourselves um, and we educate and we uh, know our history. And so I'm really excited tonight, guys, to introduce um, to you guys a, a dynamic woman who has so much knowledge in this area, um, in the areas of, of African-American history. We have uh, Dr. Val Littlefield, who is an associate professor of history at the University of South Carolina. Uh, Val received her BA in history and a BA in political science Magnum Cum Laude from North Carolina Central University in 1987. Yay, um, big ups to HBCUs. And a PhD in history from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign in 2003. Uh, Dr. Littlefield specializes in late 19th and 20th century African-American history. And her current research, research focuses on African-American rural Southern women school teachers during the Jim Crow era. Uh, Dr. Littlefield has provided leadership in a wide variety of community committee roles um, in the University of South Carolina and throughout um, our city. Uh, she has served as director of African American Studies um, at USC for seven years, and she also served as co-chair with Lacey Ford of the USC's 50th anniversary uh, desegregation com commemoration committee. Um, she has also been involved in several large community projects that highlight history. Um, she is the co-editor of a three-volume anthology called South Carolina Women, Their Lives and Times with Marjorie Spruill and Joan Johnson. And she um, is also um, uh, the, okay, the education subject editor for the nine-volume African American National Biography, which was edited by Henry Louis Gates and Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham. And so, as you can tell, not only is she very, very skilled in this area, but she has made sure that part of her skills go to educating people about this important issue. So y'all please help me welcome a Dr. Val Littlefield. And thank you so much Val for coming. I appreciate you so much. Well, thanks for having me. So I know, and the reason I thought about definitely having you on this day, Women's Equality Day, is because uh, number one, I know you know so much about this um, topic, but you did a talk last week that I missed about the role um, of African-American women um, in the suffrage movement. And so um, even this week on Sunday, I was part of um, a show on uh, SCE TV about women's suffrage. And during that show, um, it, I was having a conversation with a lady from the League of Women Voters, uh, Kelly Barron, who I hope to get on the sh in this show um, soon. Uh, she and I were talking today. Um, but Keller was saying that even for her, she didn't know um, really the role that African-American women played in women's suffrage, but we still did not get the right to vote at that time. And, you know, and she said, well, well they don't teach it in the history books. And we know that there's so much that our history books do not teach us. There's so much that we should know about our heritage and our culture that we just don't get. And so I was really excited to be able to have you here, hopefully to enlighten some folks, but also and an opportunity to answer any questions. So those of you who are joining us, if you have any questions, please make sure you put them in the chat and also make sure that y'all share this um, share this broadcast. I always encourage y'all to share all of the broadcasts because we certainly, we always get topics that are really timely. 
But this is so important for Women's Quality Day. And so I hope you share this and invite your friends to listen because this is really, really great information. And for those of you who might be watching the replay, just still go ahead and put your comments or questions in the chat and I'll make sure I get those to you. Uh, but Val, um, like I said to everybody, happy Women's Equality Day. Let me just ask you, start off and asking, as a historian, what does Women's Equality Day mean to you? Well, for me, it brings me to present. When we think about women's capabilities and when we think about women's expectations, there is this huge gap between reality and those expectations and those capabilities. And that can be in any arena. That can be in the arena of politics. For South Carolina, we know there are not a lot. We have a dire need of more women uh, in the political arena. We have a dire need of more women in leadership positions. When you think of higher ed, uh, when you think of, you can think of any level and women are missing. Our corporations, it doesn't matter, they're missing. And, and so part of it is for me, equality means getting rid of that gap and we have a long way to go but that that for me would be equality that is so true and you know this year i've talked um a lot i, I well i usually talk a lot but especially this year, with everything that we've talked about and dealt with this summer i also talk a whole lot about understanding the difference between equality and equity mm -hmm. um, and I, I shared with folks is that you know that we want both yes. and we need to understand and that we've got to fight for equality. But once you have uh, equality, that doesn't mean that um, you have still uh, gained equity in, right. in the right. sense that, it, um, you know, that we can say we've arrived because mm -hmm. everybody has the right to vote. You know, when you mm -hmm. understand that even though everybody has an equal right to vote, uh, there might not be equitable access to ballot, yes. equitable access to elected in leadership positions. And so, um, so I, there's so many things that we can, we can recognize that we've done right to get here, but there's so many things I think we have to recognize that we have to do more to make sure that we have an equitable society. And, and so I'm so excited to have you here. Um, so, so thinking about the 19th amendment, you know, so last, as I mentioned, we recognize the centennial of the ratification of the 19th amendment. Um, but that, the amendment did not give all women the right to vote. Mm -hmm. um, and like I mentioned before, um, in conversations, um, not everybody understands that. They're like, oh, you know, it's, it, you know, everybody has the right to vote, but they don't really know, yeah, you know, that not everybody got the right to vote. Why do you think more people don't understand and recognize that? Well, I think part of it is the teaching of history and how it's been taught. Uh, you know, there, there's that old famous African saying that if uh, when the lion's story is told, we will know a true story or a more balanced story about the hunt. So you get the hunter's story, but you don't get the lion's side of it. And so that is part of what happens with history. Um, those who are in a position uh, or who have been in a position to write, to research, to get published, uh, have written many of them from the hunter's perspective. And so minorities and others often get left out. Uh, they get left, left out sometimes, a lot of times intentionally. Uh, they also get left out because uh, people sometimes can be very lazy. And people bring different experiences to the table. So I may look at a document and you may look at a document and because of our differences in experiences, see something entirely different. And I'll give you an example of this. Uh, there's a South Carolinian uh, who now teaches at Duke. Um, there was a, a, I know you remember the Chestnut Diary. Mm -hmm. And so Chestnut wrote a diary during the, during the Civil War. And historians had looked at this diary and said it was the best, the best, basically the best thing since sliced bread. So in other words, that it had an accurate picture of the Civil War because she lived through it and she wrote about it during that particular time period. Davolia Glimp, the professor and, and the uh, South Carolinian, went to, not to the published diary, but to the handwritten diary of Mary Chestnut and looked at the differences. 
And so where Mary Chestnut's published diary talked about black women in a different way in that they ran off with black soldiers, they left their children. I mean, she painted African-American women in a very bad picture. I mean, she just, we, we became those stereotypical images in her published diary, okay? However, in the written diary, she talked about union soldiers and Confederate soldiers forcing black women to do certain things. So the published diary was different than the handwritten diary. So then you have to think about why, why did she change? Well, she wanted to sell the book. And it's also at a particular time period where we are demonizing African-Americans. But if the historians who talked about how great her diary was had looked at her written diary, maybe they wouldn't have said that. But it took, you know, decades for a black woman historian to look at that from a different perspective because she went back to the original. She wanted to know what did she say originally. So, again, when, you know, when the story is told by the lion, it's a little different. Uh, we, we get to see a different picture. So, so that's that's one reason. That, that's so powerful. I th thank you for sharing that because that is really the way to think about it. Because even like now where there's a conversation about um, the monuments and whether or not monuments need to be taken down and what, what do we do from that. And I've heard a lot of people say, which is really true, that um, even if some don't come down, we need to reflect history um, in, in the fullness of history. Mm -hmm. um, you can recognize, um, you know, the things that Strom Thurmond did for this state. Um, but you have to also acknowledge his segregationist history um, and some of the things that he did and make sure that you also, um, you know, don't forget, um, you know, his his black daughter. And, you know, and, and so you've got to tell the fullness of the story of, of Strom Thurmond if you're going to say it. It doesn't yeah. negate his long serving in the Congress. It doesn't negate, you know, being governor. But you need right. to talk about the fullness. Yes. And that's so interesting because we don't always talk about the fullness of history, um, whether yeah. it's you know our founding fathers. Um, yeah. You know, my, my children love Hamilton. I love Hamilton. Yeah. But when you talk about, you know, the founding fathers and, and, and the role that they played in, you know, in the history of this this country, you need to recognize the good with the bad. You do. And, you know, and the thing when I teach the, the Confederate memorials, uh, to my, with my students, we talk about, I have them look at timelines and I have them look at when these statues go up and you can tell there, there are certain spikes, there are certain times that we get United Orders of the Confederacy, that we get these statues go, going up. So the first wave, you're talking about 1880s, 1890s. And I ask my students, what's happening in the 1880s and 1890s? lynchings. That is when you're trying to put African-Americans back into this box that you think they belong to. Uh, this is this is the cementing of Jim Crow. All right. So those statues go up for a reason. When you think about when we got the flag, it's in the 60s. So it's back. It's, much of it is, we often say, well, you know, that was during that time and, and you can't put the emotions and the things we have during this time. There were emotions from a historical standpoint as well. And people were trying to make points. And they did. Statues went up. Uh, that was telling a group of people something. And so we have to take that into consideration. What were they trying to tell us? We know what they were trying to tell people of color. Okay? These are the heroes. And you really don't matter, even though you were in South Carolina and you were the majority group. So, those, so you've, you've got to look at those kinds of things when we think about those statues and and those things that we that we have up that we were that we're wrestling with now they went up for a reason mm -hmm. yeah definitely and we've got to understand that uh, like I, I remember during the flag debate as long as it took people mm -hmm. we'd always say well it's history and you know it's always been up there and people a lot of people who said that didn't even realize that it went up in the 60s right. and was right. only supposed to stay up for a certain amount of time right. so yeah. Yeah. yeah so it's exactly you know you I had a quote debate with a young man on the radio today and he was where it was about coronavirus. So it wasn't mm -hmm. really about, it wasn't about racial stuff, but he was, he was giving his narrative about things. And, and I ex explained to him, I said, wait a minute, that's not true what you're saying. So just, if you're going to, if you're going to debate me, that's fine, but be right. factual. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and so we, we've got to be factual. So those of you, thank you guys who are just joining us. I'm talking to Dr. Val Littlefield. And we're talking about um, the, Af- the role of the African-American female in the suffrage mo- movement. So please make sure if you have any comments, you go ahead and put them in the, in the um, chat. And then also make sure that you share this conversation, um, share it and invite your friends to watch because it's, it's really, really enlightening. Um, so let's talk about suffrage. Okay? Okay. Today's Women's Equality Day. And we've talked about the 19th Amendment and the ratification. Um, but most people don't know the role that African-American women played. Uh, you and I talked about this offline and I shared this in a speech I gave this morning um, um, over at the State House uh, about the fact that, you know, um, I'm, I'm a member of Delta Sigma Theta and our 22 founders um, were part of that first march. And um, and they were um, they were part of it, but they were they were made to march in the back of the line. Uh Um, and, and we know that there are so many African-American women who were part of the fight for women's suffrage, Uh but in 1920, when women were granted the right to vote or earned the right to vote, African-American women did not earn that, that same right. So Uh can you share with us, um, what are, what role did African-American women play in that suffrage movement particularly? Okay, great. They were there from the beginning. Um, and we often don't think about those women who were there from the beginning. There is an author, uh, Rosalind Turbar Penn, who died this year, um, wrote one of the first books on black women uh, suffragists. And so I would strongly encourage our audience to take a look at that book. You can get it paperback. It's been reprinted uh, during this particular year, as a matter of fact. And so when you think about the suffrage movement, you're thinking 1848, well, when you think of that first wave, you've got Sojourner Truth, who was an illiterate uh, former uh, slave, former enslaved woman. You have people like Frances Ellen Harper. You've got Harriet Purvis um, and Margarita Fortin. They are sisters. And whereas you have mostly middle class black women in the early suffrage movement and you will see mostly middle class black women throughout the suffrage movement part of that deals with class who has who has access who has the time uh, to be involved and and so that's why you get that particular middle class group now what we do need to figure out is later on are there other classes of women who are involved and we just haven't done enough research to figure out and you know part of it is also these women's histories were basically left out their writings their um materials a lot of times you have to dig really deep to find it and so it's going to take some time but we do need to do some searching for those those for that kind of information uh, newspaper articles to figure out who's who's there. But we do have quite a bit of information on those middle class black women who were extremely active. So if you're taking somebody like um, the Purvises and, and the Fortins, these are Philadelphia folks. Their parents were abolitionists. Uh, their parents were very wealthy sale uh, makers. And so you're looking at women who were educated and again, had access to these types of, of, of movements. But they and they left records, they left their writings. So we can talk about what how they felt, the kind of issues that were involved. And 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 I'm going to talk a little bit later on about the tension points. I'm sure you're going to ask me about that. But they are there. And then we see second waves. We see an Adele uh, Hunt Logan of Tuskegee, Alabama, uh, who dies in 1915. And what and and she comes in that second wave when you're thinking about the early 1900s to about 1920. And one of she has a great statement. I'm going to read it. It's it's a short one, and I just want to read what she says about it because it points to some of those tensions that are happening. She says, "If white American women, with all their natural and acquired advantages, need the ballot, how much more do Black Americans, male and female, need the strong defense of a vote to help secure?" their right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, She was a staunch suffragist. Uh, So again, when you think about the suffrage movement and you think about the role of African-American women, they pushed Americans to live up to that constitutional ideal 
in many ways, not that we've lived up to it. Uh, certainly you see that the suffrage movement provides a very good example of us not living up to that. But they pushed and, and they tried to get it through. And they went once there was a split, and we can talk a little bit more about that. They went, it didn't mean that they stopped. It just meant that they went a different direction, but still for the same goal. And they always wanted to make sure that everybody, they believed in universal suffrage. They never wavered from that. White women wavered from that. Black women never wavered from universal suffrage. They thought the males should have, they thought everybody should have access to the ballot. Class uh, didn't matter, is, didn't matter. They did not waver from that. It's very similar to universal education when we get the reconstruction period mm -hmm. and yet this group of folks fighting for universal education. They never waver from the fact that everybody should have access to education. It shouldn't be for the rich. It shouldn't be for the males. Everybody should have access. So I want to definitely get to the the role of African American women in South Carolina in the movement, but I want I want to stay with that point a little bit where you just went because what you said is just really so true and so telling even today. Mm -hmm. um, and it's and it's so um, you know if you look at the role of African American women even now in voting. I mean we are. Um, you know, largely the Democratic Party, you yeah. know, we're the biggest voting bloc in the Democratic Party. Yeah. Um, when you hear, you know, who helped, um, who voted for Hillary Clinton, who oh. helped Doug Jones, you know, all these recent elections, who mm -hmm. who right now everybody is trying to get for this election that's coming up in 70 days, it's the black female vote. And so, yeah. you know, we we tend to, I mean, we, we once we earned our right to vote um, or were, were able to obtain our right to vote. We always, we always had, had earned it, but um, you know, we have, we've not wavered from that participation and, and, and having that vocal voice. Um, mm -hmm. But it's just interesting also what you said about how, um, although there was, you know, we were together at one point in, in asking for the right to vote, mm -hmm. there were white women who that was not, it wasn't universal. And, and so there was a split. And I just think about kind of even where we are now, like we, uh, this year, we've had a lot of conversations. I've had a lot of great conversations with um, some of my, my Caucasian friends about um, racial justice, um, uh, social justice, equality, equity, and that kind of thing. And, um, and how honestly, you know, sometimes when you are able to, uh, operate from a, a place of privilege, mm -hmm. um, you, um, you're willing to say, well, let's get this. And, and, and so you zone in on that. And once you and, and your friends have maybe gotten it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it, it's not as important to keep that fight for others. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, um, that's some, sometimes really hard to, to, to really dissect. Yeah. Um, because if, if you're not willing to do some self-reflection to recognize that that might be where you're thinking and where your position is, you, you, um, you, you're, will, you're, you're, you're willing to settle yes. for the little bit that is given and not really fight for that true equality for everybody. Yeah. Um, so uh, can you share with us about that tension and, and, and the break? Um, yeah. Cause I, I think that's really important for people that probably don't know. Well, the break comes um, really comes on really strong when you get to the 15th Amendment, 1870, uh, the, the arguments to give black men uh, the right to vote. So women, the people involved in the women's suffrage movement, especially uh, Stanton and Anthony, are arguing that uh, women should also have the right to vote. And therefore, that male within the within the the amendment should be, or the arguments that put male in there, to take it out, that it should, it should be, everybody should have the right to vote, male and female. And so when you get abolitionists trying to encourage some, some abolitionists, not all, but trying to encourage the white women's suffragists and some black women's suffragists, that 
now is the time for African American men to get the right to vote. They should get the right to vote. This, this is the timing is perfect. If we add women, it's going to complicate the process. I can see both sides. Okay. But the bottom line is what happens when you give up the big fight, which should have been the fight for everybody to get it. We'll never know whether it would have passed or not. All right. So you have a group of female suffragists, including Anthony and Stanton, who argue we can't wait. And it becomes very a very racist um, platform after that. Uh, basically, what's bannered around is ignorant and degraded black men. And so white women are saying, well, why should ignorant and degraded black men uh, who were slaves get the right to vote over educated white women? So you got this class, you got race all playing in here over this 15th Amendment. And then it just goes from there and, and then you get you get the, uh, the splits. And the other thing that's happening is the suffragists want uh, the Southern, once, once that amendment is passed, the Northern suffragists now want the white women, Southern white women, to join in to the suffrage movement so that they can get it passed. Well, in order to do that, the South, in the meantime, is passing all sorts of Jim Crow laws, and therefore, they're not interested in working with African Americans, and they're trying their best to make sure African Americans don't get anywhere near the polls, and uh, or a ballot box, or however you want to put it. And so, therefore, uh, white Northern women basically give up uh, this universal suffrage, many of them, uh, the majority, give up the, the universal suffrage for, some call it expediency, whatever you want to call it, it's given up. And, you know, Frederick Douglass, who had been a staunch ally of Stanton and, and, and he had, he had gone around, he had, he had done marches, he had done uh, talks about the suffrage movement. And when it, got time for them to go south to convince southern women to join of course they asked him not to show up so it's you know it's those kinds of things that come out that show you that people aren't always willing to go like you said that extra that extra mile that they need to go to ensure that everybody is included um it, it becomes let me get mine first and 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 if it's between you and me or a portion of you and me, then it's then it's going to be me. So I guess what was happening here in South Carolina? Like, what role did African American women in South Carolina play? Because I mean, we are we are in the South. We, you know, we know clearly we had segregationists and a lot of Jim Crow. I mean, so that was playing out right here in the South. So, what yes. role um, did Black women play here? Well, black women here, it's a really interesting story. And it's, you know, that's where the Rollins sisters come in. Uh, part of it is that when you think of South Carolina, when you look, if you go, if you Google the suffrage movement in South Carolina, it will immediately jump to the 1880s, 1890s, where Virginia Young, uh, who single-handedly, they argue, takes over the suffrage movement in South Carolina and takes it to another level. And then when she dies, it falters some and then it's picked back up toward the end of the 20th, toward the end of, of the passage of the suffrage uh, amendment. But what they leave out is doing reconstruction. You had five sisters from Charleston. They were the Rollins sisters. And they were Francis, Charlotte, Catherine, Louise, and Florence. We know more about Francis, Catherine, Francis, Charlotte, and Catherine than we do the other two, um, but we know we know quite a bit about the first three. And so, when you think of these sisters, they were born in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, their father and mom, their father was of French extraction, we think, at least that's what, what has been written, and they owned slaves. Uh, he was very, very wealthy. He had a lumber business and he traveled a lot. He also had contracts with the city of Charleston. He also hired Irish workers. And so therefore for voting, 
the whites would come to him to help convince the Irish workers how to vote. So they had always been involved in, in so the sisters grew up uh, in a politically active, in a different kind of way, but certainly in a political astute uh, environment, shall we say. And so when Reconstruction happens, Francis is the first one we know about. And so Francis uh, sues, uh, this is 1867, if my memory serves me correctly, she sues a uh, steamer from transporter from uh, the Beaufort to the Charleston area. She goes back and forth and he will not give her a first class ticket. And she sues and wins $250. And the person who helps her uh, make this suit is Delaney, who was Martin Delaney, who was Union soldier, uh, came to South Carolina and stayed, and was the highest ranking uh, Union soldier. And so he stays, works for the Freedmen Bureau. He also has a law, gets a law degree. And so he is her lawyer. And he convinced, he is impressed by her and asked her to write his diary, write his uh, biography. And she goes to Boston and she does write the biography of the first biography of, of Martin Delaney. And it's published under the name of Frank Rollin. But that's what our family called her. They called her Frank. So she was okay. But the publishers wanted to do that because they didn't think the book would sell if she used her female name. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so when she comes back, she meets Richard Greener is one of her escorts. She finds him a little on the cold side. She doesn't see him as somebody she'd want to, to be a long time partner. Uh, but uh, he, you know, he's, he's at Harvard at the time and, and he does, they do do a little courting, but she leaves. But when she finishes the biography, she comes back to South Carolina to Charleston. She teaches for a short time. Uh, she and her sister Charlotte at Freedman schools. Avery is one of them where, uh, where we know Francis taught. And then uh, they end up moving to Columbia. And they move to Columbia um, and they purchase the house that Maxie Gregg owned, Confederate Maxie Gregg, which is kind of interesting. interesting. They move into it. We think they rent it for a couple of years, but then they end up buying it. And so they move into it and it becomes the salon where everybody who is anybody in the Republican Party meets at that particular location. So, and so when, let me ask you, stop you there. When you said Republican Party, back then, the Republican Party was not the Republican Party we think of now. No, no. This is this is the this is the real party of Lincoln. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. when you get them moving, the sisters move to uh, to Columbia. And Francis starts working uh, in the state house with Whipper. And she ends up marrying him uh, within six months. He's a widow. And, and she marries him six months after she starts uh, her job. And he's a perfect match for her. He is a staunch believer in women's rights. As a matter of fact, Whipper argues that um, Black women were superior to black men. This is William J. Whipper argues that black women were superior to black men and white men and white women. They were the superior group. Um, he believed in equality for women. Uh, he was one of the people who for the longest was a staunch advocate for women's voting rights. And so they were they were a good they were a very good match in in their ideals about roles of women their ideas about equality uh, and access. So this is a you know that's just a little bit about Frances. When we think about she also is the Beaufort News. Uh, it's a newspaper that she's the editor of during the Reconstruction period, and so she writes about the suffrage movement. But what happens at this at this salon is that they end up um, not only testifying before the legislators. Charlotte is the one who testifies, and Charlotte argues that women should be given the right to vote. 
before our South Carolina legislators. And so, so we have that. And then in 1870, we have a, a women's right convention in Columbia, 1870. The Rollins sisters are heading this up, all right? And you have people like Governor Scott, who is encouraging women to get the right to vote. You have all the big names, uh, Lieutenant Governor Ranzier and his wife, uh, of course, Whipper. And so then you have them being becoming very active in the Woman Suffrage Association. And in 1870, Charlotte is elected secretary of the South Carolina Women's Rights Association. Get this. In February 1871, we receive a charter for the first South Carolina branch of the American Women's Suffrage Association, and Lucy Stone is the president. And so we also have correspondence between Lucy Stone and Ranzier and, and correspondence between Lucy Stone and Charlotte, you know, her encouraging them. She knows times are, will be difficult, but also encouraging Ranzier to be very supportive of these women, and he agrees to do that. Um, Charlotte serves as the delegate to the National Association Conference in 1872. She becomes president of the South Carolina branch. Uh, in 1871, they lead a rally to the state house. And in 1872, the South Carolina legislatures are asked to amend the state constitution. And that is debated. And we're trying to find those minutes and that information because a lot of stuff has been destroyed during that reconstruction period. Uh, but one of the things we know, there was a fist fight, but we know that Whipper, uh, Ranzier and others were very, very supportive of women getting the right to vote. Uh, it does not happen, of course, but short and then, you know, shortly thereafter, we get 1877, we get the ending of Reconstruction. The sisters have to leave town. Um, Francis and, and Whipper move to D.C. Uh, with their children. And so that's where they end up. Whipper comes back. Francis comes back in early 1900 and, and dies in Beaufort. Um, Charlotte and the other uh, sisters we know go to Brooklyn, New York with their mother at, at, right after that. So it is, it is just... It is interesting to see how they got left out. We don't talk about that role. This is the first charter that South Carolina gets. And these are the people who started the suffrage movement. And the other impact that when you think about that particular time period, you have black, white, male, female, all working together. You don't get that in the South after that. Oh, we, we don't see that. And, and we see... A, a decreasing of that in the north, because when the two, when the when the larger northern group separates, they don't want one part doesn't want the men. They don't want men involved in it at all, and so it's all women. And but here you are looking at South, little old South Carolina, that sees the need for everybody to be at the table, mm -hmm. yeah. and that's extremely important. So by the time you get to the second wave of women in the suffrage movement, what you get is National Council of Negro Women. So you get your local organization still pushing for suffrage, but doing it, educating women so that when they do get the right to vote, but also being realistic, understanding this particular time period of Jim Crow, they're still struggling to get the right to vote, but also understanding that this is really a hard road to hoe. But it didn't stop them from fighting for it. So I actually put um, up here for folks who want to know more about the Rollins sisters or others that um, other amazing women, uh, Columbia City of Women um, honored the Rollins sisters last year. Um, also this year we're, we've honored uh, uh, Miss Donnella Wilson, who yeah. Um, has voted in voted in every single election since 1948 when she first got the right to vote up until the time she died a few years ago. Um, 
and and she's just an extraordinary woman. So go, please go to Columbia City of Women to learn more. Um, so I definitely want to get that. Um, so before you, you go you, to the next question, let me share one thing that Charlotte, uh, this is her talking in 1870 uh, about the suffrage movement. And she's in Charleston giving a talk. And she says, we ask suffrage not as a favor, not as a privilege, but as a right based on the ground that we are human beings and as such entitled to all human rights. While we concede that women's ennobling influence should be confined chiefly to home and society, we claim that public opinion has had a tendency to limit women's sphere to too small a circle. And until women and, and until woman has the right of representation, this will last and other rights will be held by an insecure tenure. Very true. I, I actually use a part of that. The first line of that I used this morning in my speech. Oh, <laughs> so, so yes, oh, oh, just favorite. powerful. So yeah. and and so you said a minute ago, and um, so that kind of leads me to my next question. You know, right now, um, twenty twenty, we are at. You know, everyone concedes we are at a racial reckoning point in our country. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of um, a, a lot of folks who are just really tired of. Uh, systemic racism, um, you know, not having equitable access to, you know, not just, you know, positions of power, but, you know, just quality of life issues. And so it is a, it is a, a pivotal, pivotal, pivotal time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a lot of people uh, say it's a turning point. Um, but, you know, I think there are some people who are like, they're, they're impatient. They want to hurry up and, and, and get there. Um, and then there's others who are really thoughtfully thinking about, you know, where where do we need changes and, and how do we effectively get those changes so that they can be permanent? And so I was just kind of wondering from, from that standpoint, like listening to you and, you know, particularly the Rawlings sisters, you know, they they did a lot and put, put their health and safety um, on the line and, and to the point where they ended up leaving South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, when we think about access to voting, um, you know, George Elmore and those of you who are watching who might not know the story of George Elmore here in Columbia, I, I encourage you please to learn yeah. about it. But George Elmore, you know, sued for the right to, to participate in the Democratic um, primary here mm -hmm. um, and, and won and, you know, and then was, you know, his store burned down and yeah. his family yeah. tormented. So he had to leave. Yes. And so, you know, I, I look at the, kind of some of those things, people really put themselves in harm's way for the, the greater good. Yeah. Um, but the, the progress wasn't seen overnight. Right. Um, what lessons do you feel like we, we should learn from particularly, you know, the African-American suffrage movement and particularly the role that black women play, um, and and that and what role can we what lessons can we learn from that to implement today as we are seeking a more just and equitable society mm -hmm. and as we are you know really seeking um, more access to to a seat at the table in 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 rooms that have been traditionally closed to us. Yeah, you know, I think one thing that movements, especially movements that African Americans have been. Uh, a huge part of uh, like the suffrage movement or the civil rights movement is that there's room at the table for every kind of avenue you want, you are willing to take. And let me, let me put it this way. When you think about uh, getting things changed, it is always painful because number one, those in power do not want to change if it means giving up anything. And they see it as giving up something, whether it is from an emotional standpoint or financial standpoint or whatever. They're just not willing to give it up. Um, and when you when you think of people in power, one of the hardest things to do is to get them to relinquish some of that power, no matter what. We are human beings, and so we have to be pushed. So when you look at a, a modern civil rights movement or when you look at the long civil rights movement or the or the suffrage movement, people came at people use different strategies at different times and sometimes simultaneously. And so I don't for the people who are marching, that is part of the movement for the people who are sitting at the table strategizing for long term solutions. 
that is part of the movement. You have to have all those working parts working simultaneously. Um, and, and then sometimes one may advance and get something quicker than another part. But then you also have to have backup. And so I, I think we often think that we pit one strategy against the other, and we shouldn't do that at all. Um, strategies work at different times. Um, different strategies will work one time and the next time they will not work. And so we have to take lessons from knowing that we have to have multiple strategies at work at the same time. Well, that's what I tell people. I say, you know, we all have our role to play mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and, and there's multiple lanes. I mean, yeah. we've got the same designation, but you might have multiple might lanes have to get there and, you know, yeah. just stay in your lane, you push and you, you do what's, what feels right to you. Yes. And that might be, you know, might be marching. It might be, I, you know, I know some people say, I don't, I don't march. Well, you know, you can watch someone's kids so they can go march or, you That's know, so exactly. everybody has a role to play. Everybody has so, a role to yeah. play. And we've seen those roles played before when I, I, I researched black women school teachers. And when you look at many times that early, that earlier group is not that they're not active in civil rights. They're just hidden. They're doing things. Uh, so let's say by the time you get to the modern civil rights movement, one of the things that comes out is that you have your teachers and your uh, morticians using their homes to bail as mortgage, to bail as to bail out people who are marching and who get arrested. That doesn't come to light until much later. And so the other thing is, if you think of a Booker T. Washington, we often, you know, that wonderful stereotypical image of him as being an Uncle Tom. Well, we now know from research that Booker T. Washington was paying for lots and lots of suits against Jim Crow laws and, would, and was working hand in hand with W.B. Du Bois, but just asking, I don't want any recognition because he knew it would take away his money that he was getting from some of those philanthropists. So people work in different ways and you shouldn't poo poo how they're working. And, and you shouldn't second guess what they're doing sometimes because it can come back to bite you. They may be doing a lot more than you know they're doing. That's very true. So Sylvia Jenkins is on and she says, um, it is not, this is not taught in schools. It is through forms like this that we learn um, about history. Thank you. So thank you, Sylvia. And thank you for watching. Um, so that definitely leads it. So how do we learn? I mean, because it's not, and I, I, I applaud uh, you and Dr. Donaldson and, you know, everybody at the university who is trying to make sure that the history that is not taught in schools, that is not a lot of times in books, that we are able to um, share it in, in the community and educate um, our community about our history, because I think it's such an amazingly rich history. But what are some of the other things or how can we learn about some of the stuff that we, we just had no idea about? Yeah. You know, I think one way is, you know, ask a historian. They're, historians write wonderful stuff, but the masses aren't reading that wonderful stuff. When you think about, uh, and Black historians especially, and there are other historians as well who are doing some great stuff, but there are some wonderful, wonderful books and articles on our history that's out there. And part of it is us being able to let people know where they can find materials where they can find those readings. And I work a lot with school teachers. And so when I come in with a, I bring a suitcase in to be quite frank, of black children's books or books about black children from any, from, from any subject you wanna cover, we have it, it's out there. So our children can, now I think they're overpriced, but that's beside the point. The bottom line is we need to spend our money on those books. Uh, and because they are out there or we need to take them to the library and check them out. But they are out there. And I think we need to do as historians at academic institutions, we need to do a better job of helping the masses know where they can find these materials. And I think one way of doing that is I think our church is like a platform like this. But I also think our churches, uh, we could we could step it up. And we've got, we've got a captive audience and we should have 
seminars. We should, we should have short lessons. We should have all sorts of things that we educate people with. We should have a library in every black church that has nothing but books on, on, on black folks. It should just be there. Uh, it should be part of your donation Buy a book. Um, so I, I think we can do more ourselves to make sure that our children are learning. And if you are Caucasian or whatever, I think you can do more to make sure your children learn about other people who don't look like them to learn more about their experiences. And that's when I think we'll start making, seeing some really useful changes in the way we view each other, uh, in the way we view our history. Uh, and I think we'll be able to make uh, very good arguments when somebody says something that's false, we'll, we'll know it's false. And, and it's, it's something to know something is false and not being able to counter it with the fact. You, you need to know the fact so that you can counter it. Your gut may tell you that doesn't sound right, but unless you know the information to counter it, and that comes from just making sure that, that our kids read, that we read, that we're up on, on materials, um, that we know our history. And I often tell my, my black students, just because you're black, you don't know your history. I can assure you, you don't know it. I'm still learning it. There's so much to, to, to be learned and you pick your niche and you, and you go from there. Uh, whether it be while you're riding these long distance rides and you, you know, you put Michelle Obama's talk in the, in your, in your car and listen to it or a Langston Hughes talking about his portrait. I mean, we just, we need to do that. We need to be, we need to be more assertive about learning our history because we can't expect the schools to teach our history the way it should be taught. Number one, they don't have the time. And number two, they're not going to do it. Yeah. They, many of them don't know it themselves. And, and so therefore they can't teach you what they don't know. Okay. They've gotten better, but, but they can't teach you what they don't know. Well, it's so funny to that point. So uh, we are a part of a family group that, um, except for this year because of coronavirus, mm -hmm. we travel together for during spring break. And it started just really with a group of educators um, and then our, our families. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, um, there's teachers, superintendents, um, school board members, and we all go. But the whole goal is to teach our children uh, African-American culture that they do not teach in schools. And right. so we travel. Last year, we went to Philadelphia. Amazing, amazing time. Yeah. Um, went to um, uh, the uh, AME um, um, Museum and, you know, of course, went um, went to the Constitution Hall and all that stuff. So it was amazing. But anyway, um, but the first year, so it's been kind of incremental. In the first year, you know, we talked a whole lot about how our people were enslaved because we mm -hmm. were free and we were brought over. So we were enslaved. And so don't let anyone talk about being slaves, that we were enslaved people. Mm -hmm. And so one of the little girls, when she went back to school and her teacher was teaching about slaves, she raised her hand and she said, Miss so-and-so, uh, they are enslaved persons, not slaves. And and the teacher called her mom and was like, you know, I really had not, you know, I wasn't trying to be offensive. I had not right. thought about that. And that teacher learned something from that little girl yeah. to start yeah. referencing it as enslaved persons. And so, you know, you're so right. I mean, we've got to take that extra, extra step yes. to educate ourselves and our families. And as we then interact with others, we will continue to educate them too. That so. is so true. And, you know, we can start at home. And when you think about the city of Columbia, we have so many spaces that our landscape is, and you can do this in any city, but the landscape is just rich with African-American history. Just go for it, you know, take your child uh, to Majeska Simpkins house. This is free. Take, you know, take your child to a Benedictine and, and an Allen and talk about the establishment of those schools. Um, you know, just, do a little reading. That's all you got to do and spark their interest so that they will do more reading or find your, you know, your, the sign that talks about Elmore. Uh, all of those things, they're here. So you don't need black churches. Start talking about the history of black churches. We don't have to go very far. We can we can do a good history lesson right in our backyard uh, and then and then supplement it with those trips to Philadelphia and those trips to other places. 
that's easy enough to do. And, and when the museum offers materials or an exhibit dealing with us, we need to show up. Uh, whether it's the art museum or the state museum or any place on campus, when they're offering those things, take your children. They need to see yeah. them. Exactly. Yeah, to that point right now, the Columbia Museum of Art has that exhibit, Black is Beautiful. And I haven't actually not even seen it yet myself, but my goal is to see it within the next week. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and then, you know, you guys do some great things at University of South Carolina. And people need to recognize that having this flagship university right here, it's not only for students and yeah, faculty right. of USC for our community. And so go and see the great things that they have. I mean, I, I just, the Justice for All exhibit was amazing and mm -hmm. I hate that it was temporary, but I've right. talked to Dr. Donaldson about how do we find a, a permanent location, right. you know, for those materials mm -hmm. because they, it's just extraordinary and we need to know that. So. Yeah. Yes. So anyway, as we are coming to uh, a close of our time, I, Dr. Littlefield, I, I can't thank you enough. This has been yes. so enlightening. And I want to kind of keep in touch with you so that we can do this more often, because I do think that platforms like this can help us learn more. Um, but also, as I challenge every time I do this show, I challenge people to take the information you got and come up with an action item, mm -hmm. whether it is buying one of those books that you talked about for yourself or for young people, mm -hmm. uh, for, you know, uh, for, you know, someone who doesn't look like you and share right. that, right. um, and, and, and figure out how do you do that? Um, and, and so I think that's really important. And then, you know, again, with, with women's equality day, as we end up, I have to say we are 70 days away from an election yeah. and there are, um, from, from president all the way down to County council, yeah municipal races and school board races. And so we need to make sure our voices are heard um, and that, you know, we recognize that the role, particularly that black women have played in elections in this country are, is tremendous. Yes. Uh, we come out to vote and not only do we vote, but we take people with us, which is amazing. So we need to continue that. If we want to see the changes that we really want to see in our country, we've got to be active participants, you know, um, Democracy is not a spectator sport. It's not. No. It's something we all got to be engaged in at every level. And so um, I hope that people are inspired to learn more about um, the women's right to vote, the fight for the right to vote, mm -hmm. so that we truly appreciate what a, what a, a tremendous uh, right it is and that we continue to exercise it. Yeah. So anyway, uh, for those of you who are joining us again, thank you. If you have any questions who are watching, the re if you watch the replay, make sure you put them in the chat and I will make sure if I can't answer it, I get it to Dr. Littlefield and she answers that for you. So anyway, I, I will be back next week. I have actually, Monday is the first day of school, for, oh. virtual school, but the first day of school. So I am not sure what we'll be talking about if I will be here Monday because I might be exhausted <laughs> <laughs> with work, working and still trying to help support kids um, home. But um, but anyway, but we will be back uh, sometime next week with some great topics. So until next time, I'm Councilwoman Tamika Isaac Devine. Thank you for watching Community Conversations. Uh, thank you. Good night and God bless. Good night.